Yeah, of course. Actually, Tom, would you mind sharing about the challenge first? And then I'm going to dive into to buy this. Itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're thrilled to be part of this hackathon. Um, we're so excited to see what you all develop um, and to meet and work with the other sponsors and you know, everything that comes with it. We actually have two, ha uh, two challenges going on um, throughout this hackathon. So the first is focused on the, uh, the education track. Um, more specifically, we're looking at the use of verified credentials in the employee onboarding stage of, well, I guess the, the, the last stage of education, really. Um, but making use of those educational credentials in helping people find a career, a job and a place at another company um, and what that might look like. Um, this actually interestingly comes from primary on the ground research we've done with a couple of different educational institutions um, and speaking with lots of other organizations in the space is that there really is a demand for a, a, a portal or an application, whatever you want to call it, that helps onboard new employees into an organization and brings across those credentials from universities, colleges, educational institutes. So that's a really interesting track. Um, I think it's particularly interesting because there is a real world demand for it. So anybody that's looking to take on that challenge, it's it it's got legs to go the distance and become an actual, you know, proper proper project. Um, and there is demand for it. The other track we have is in the reusable identity space, which I know is quite popular amongst this hackathon. Um, and it's very much looking at the sort of diverse range and range of sources that credentials can come from and identities can come from and matching them together. So using, um, you know, maybe your passport, your driving license, your birth certificate, et cetera, and how you work out which type of credential is, they, they, they may all use your date of birth, but which type of credential is best suited to be the uh, source of truth for your of birth um, and then on the other side of that same coin is in the same reusable identity piece is what happens when you have credentials one singular credential being used in multiple places so again date of birth being used for travel or being used for age gated uh access etc so yeah those are our two challenges um education and verified credential onboarding and reusable identities um we're very excited to see what you all build cool all right thank you tom thank you very much um let me introduce myself i'm also going to start sharing the screen i've got a couple of slides um but mostly we're going to be inside of the dashboard and then inside of postman to show how all the api calls work um i would do it in terminal but i think postman's going to make it a little bit more easy to consume and you can see all the curl commands there as well if you need to uh, we'll also make that Postman collection available to everyone um, afterwards. So uh, my name is Rob, uh, the CTO at uh, Vidos. I still self-identify as a developer, um, much to probably the frustration of the developers in my team who wish that I would probably do a little bit less of that. Um, but all this is to say we're building a tool for developers out in the space to make things easier. What we believe is that you should be able to focus on the core product that you're building and we're here to try and help you build um, or to make that easier. So uh, some of the things that we, uh, you know, the two products that we have out there at the moment or two services and we're sort of rolling more services um, and we work on them at the moment. And we wanna make sure that these services are fully encompassing. They solve the task as completely as possible. So the first one we're going to is Resolver and the second one is Verify. I'm gonna do a quick demo of both of them. Um, and actually let's just dive into the dashboard so we can take a little look um, what it all looks like. So um, first off, you'll get in notice we've got the, the resolvers and the verifiers and access management. Um, actually, let's start with the, start with the vegetables. So let's go through access management. We have the, the API keys. Um, you can set these up and you can assign permissions to them. We've got a bunch of pre-made policies which makes life easier. Um, all this is to say that you can get extremely granular on the permissions that are available um, to a given API key, whether that is a management of the instances or the configurations, aka the ability to be an administrator or consuming the service. 
what I've done just to make life easier, which is probably a good way for you to start off at least, is to create an API key, which we say key material, patch the policy or service access. Um, and that will give you, um, give that API key the ability to call the resolution endpoints and to call the verify, verify endpoints. You can lock that down more specifically to the service as well. Um, what, what, let's actually now get into um, one of the resolver instances. So I've created an instance and I'm going to demo that. It's, it's not overly exciting. You can imagine how it works. Um, inside of here, you can configure, you can pick a cause um, if you're doing front-end application. Probably this is going to be used in a, a non-front-end application, but still it's, it's good to kind of take a little look what's going on. Um, pretty simply here, we have a tester and this very, very, um, as expected, is going to resolve that div method for you. So um, why the resolver? The resolver is really here to give you the ability to accept any credentials issued with any of the div methods that we support. We aim to support all the methods that um, are commonly used. We've got about 14 at the moment. Um, I think they're all listed here inside this collection. If there's, some, if there's a method that you feel that we should be supporting, please let us know the Discord channel, channel. We're in the Discord channel. We'll be as responsible as we can. We'd love to know which ones are missing, what your use cases are. What I will say about the methods that are here um, is we've gone for as complete coverage as we possibly can. Um, so let's take a look at Checked. They give some really good examples here of um, uh, did, the, did URL dereferencing. So this is a plain um, document and inside the documents. So I'm just moving around the Zoom window so I'm out of the way. Um, you can see the verification method. They've got a few service endpoints, so you can dereference those. Um, and here you can do authentication. If we take a little look at an example of dereferencing, um, let's go grab the, the standard document. So it is here. Um, if you look, it's got versioning information. And if we went and took one of those version IDs and um, resolve that, you would actually get the specific document at that moment in time. So that's really helpful in that situation where perhaps you need to look at a moment in time. So you could do that with the time or a, an, a specific identifier of that document. Um, if you note here, they tend to have next and previous versions of them. Um, so it really allows you to get a good indication of what happened when and potentially even step through to understand the change. Uh, another one that I'm going to skip over this one that I really like here is, you know, I've got to get it right. Uh, I think it's this one here. Ah, this one here. So this is a dig, so I did linked resource. What they have done, they've embedded a piece of information in this sense. It's hello world that is encoded. Um, text, I believe, or JSON, I can't remember now. Um, there's two different examples. Um, and what it means is inside the linked data resource, here it is, it's text up plain, you can embed information that then can be available to end users um, in whatever format you want. Um, there's actually a lot of documentation that uh, put out there, but that's another one of these things that we've not just implemented the method, we've implemented the dereferencing as well to make life easier for you. Um, <clears throat> The one I'll quickly call out is probably everyone's familiar with did key. However, um, there's an awful lot of there's a, there's a lot of different types of um, key algorithms that are supported by did key. And it took us quite a long time to find all the algorithms and the the code required to go do that. So we hope that we are able to cover any of the did key resolutions that you may have. Um, so feel free to have a little navigate around this uh, collection. We've got examples of all of these. Um, if there's anything that you questions of, please let us know. But most our customers, um, so people are using the resolver inside of a verifier um, to get key material, potentially to look up services if they're doing you know, DIDCOM or other types of uh, communication. But many people are actually jumping straight to using a verifier uh, because the verifier allows you to answer a really important question um, is is this credential, is this verifiable credential or this verifiable presentation valid or okay, acceptable on the terms of the issuer? So that's what the, the purpose of the verifier is for. So um, again, with the verifier, we've taken 
quite a similar approach to what we've done with the resolver. We want the verifier to be able to verify any credential out there, regardless of how it was issued with whatever crypto suite or securing mechanism, whether that's data integrity or one of the ED signatures um, or any future methods that turn up um, and any of the crypto suites that we find. Um, also as well, I think what many people may have experienced, and this is the problem that the verifiers attempted to solve, is you perhaps have issued a credential on one platform or by one issuer, and then you've been able to verify or request it inside of a wallet with that same set of tooling or services. But then it can become a problem when you're trying to use a different example, different set of code. Often that is the case that um, when you're building a verifier, you tend to build it for the, or well, the examples tend to show you um, how to verify the credential that has been issued to you at that moment, whether that is limited by did method or by the um, version of the uh, uh, data model that's used or by the crypto scheme or by anything else. Um, however, for us to verify, we don't know who's doing the issuing. So our verifier needs to be able to verify any credential that you pass at it. And that is, that is what we're aiming for. So uh, with the verifier, um, this is again, you can create the instances, you can edit, you can start, you can stop them. Um, again, it's got the cause configuration. There's actually an awful lot of configuration we've not yet exposed. That should come very, very soon for um, how to control the credentials. So you can choose the formats. You can, um, whether that is the version you want to accept or specific crypto schemas, uh, crypto scheme, sorry, um, or whether you want to um, allow different assertion methods. So they're all available to you uh, in the configuration and or soon will be available to you in the configuration, I'm sorry, but you can programmatically set those as well. So let's take another look here at the, um, this is a kind of testing tool. So we can take a look and this is a verifiable uh, credential. Um, actually, sorry, I've missed one, one kind of important detail here is the verifier is built to the W3C um, VC API 0 .0, sorry, 0 0.3.0 specification. So that's the latest version of that, which means we support both verifying credentials and verifying presentations. So this is an example of verifying the credential. Um, you got a couple of options. Well, in this case, the option is to return the credential. Um, and when it does the verification, it will perform the checks. In this case, it performed three checks, format, proof, valid that. It gave these warnings. Um, so there was no issuance date or expiration date, which means the valid that um, did not fail, but it could only be completed without this information. So it's important for you to know and understand that. You can configure and return those as a warning, or you can ignore them completely. Um, and this is a credential that came back. There's no errors, so everything is all good here. Um, you can also do the same for a verifiable presentation. So if we take a look at the verified presentation, you'll see that the, the type of presentation inside of here, you've got a, uh, just the one credential actually that has its own proof and the presentation has a proof here. So if we went to go verify that, um, again, this time we've got no warnings, no errors, and everything called checks out with these two checks. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the same thing and skip over to uh, Postman. And we're gonna take a look at some of the additional verification options or examples that we've built here. So at a high level, we've got the two different endpoints, verifying a credential, uh, verifying a presentation. Inside of here, you can see there's some examples built with the V1 data model. So you can identify those aside from the name, but if you ever have a credential yourself and you wanna know, the V1 here, V2 actually has V2 here. Um, a quick note actually about um, examples. If you have examples, uh, one of the things that the verifier does, it doesn't require you to specify the JSON LD location for any of the additional types that you put inside of a credential. That's really helpful for testing, not something you should do in production. Um, here, so the verified presentation, in this case, we've just got examples for, for V1, but V2 um, works as well. So uh, let's go 
inspect a couple of these and i think if we've got time we might do like a exactly how this works step by step i think it might be a good for people to kind of get their their heads around so you can understand what happens in a verification um so let's look at this one this is using the crypto schema um let's go down here so first of all it's using the data integrity proof type it's using the crypto suite sorry I said schema so suite apologies of eddsa 2022 um and the assertion method um if we were to go run this let's take a little look again we've performed three checks the format valid at and the warnings so this is telling us here in this case the expiration date is missing um but there will be an issuance date as a note and this is it's quite trivial but quite useful at the same time valid at essentially searches for the issuance date and the expiration date with inside a verified credential when it is v1 for v2 they've renamed those film uh, fields to valid from and valid to please don't quote me exactly but they are renamed and it's pretty close to that so we look for the appropriate fields depending on the credential and then of course as we're supporting different credential types we're looking more specifically within those to answer these questions so after performing this you're able to reliably know that the issuer of this credential um is has signed has signed this it has not been tampered with in any way it's formatted correctly and it is valid at the time that it has been requested to be verified um if we take a look at this one this is using a different crypto suite this is using the selective uh, selective disclosure um of ecdsa and uh let's run that again again these are going to verify so it's all okay this here is using eddsa the rdfc 2022 the main difference between this and jcs which i don't actually have an example of here but um is, is how these, um, when you go and sign or when you go and verify, you'd need to make sure that the source content is exactly the same. So that really is just indicating the method or the algorithm to use to go format the credential contents. contents so they're the same. Uh, JCS essentially uses uh, canonicalization and RDFC uses JSON-LD to format the content of this. Uh, if we take a look at this one, this is one of the ones that predates the data integrity. So if we um, if we have a little look here, oops, sorry. This is using data integrity proof with a crypto suite here. Data integrity proof indicates the process, largely the outline process of how verification of the signature works. The crypto suite then indicates the the key, the um, formatting algorithm, and the, the this is the version more or less. Um, so again, if we go send one of these, we'll get, oh no, we've got an error here. That's something gone wrong. Um, well, that was unexpected. I will look into that later on. Apologies all. Um, and this here will, will verify this and we'll be able to, um, give that information as well. So let's take a look at the verified presentations. These give something that's a little bit different, largely. I've, I've put two in here. Um, to demonstrate one difference. So the this one is using an assertion method, which is the same as the assertion method that's used to verify the credential itself. Probably not the most common use case. Mostly someone is going to use the authentication method. So what that means is the proof here, sorry, um, this is the proof process purpose of assertion method for the verifiable credential and for the verifiable presentation, let me just try and shrink this down so it's a bit easier to consume. It uses the authentication method. The th this comes into, and I'll I'll do a step through of how um, verification works in a moment. But this is all about the key material and the intended purpose of it. Plus, for the case of authentication, you choose the um, you can specify a challenge in the domain. And if you look here, we've got the options of challenge and domain. If we were to go and alter the challenge or the domain, as you would expect, things don't match and it would fail. So that's that's how it would be used inside of a uh, authentication use case. What some of the kind of the common use cases that we see with the verified resolver is 
if when you have credentials and you want to do a verification often when you when you request a credential you can do the, the verification is done at that moment however if you have a job where you need to um, re-verify something either shortly after or significantly after or try and look you know to ver to confirm or re-verify something that you already have this is where this service really really becomes useful and there's a lot of use cases where you can imagine yes I've been given that credential now, so I'm going to allow someone access into a service or I'm going to give someone a benefit. However, I need to recheck that. And um, this allows you to do that recheck offline without having to ask someone to represent those credentials. Um, and there's many use cases that you can imagine where this would happen. Um, probably the key thing is not needing to re-request things from the user, but still being able to be sure that things are valid at that moment. Um, also, I want to pause here as well. If there's questions from anybody, please do shout up. I'm kind of keeping an eye on the, the window at the side. Um, but let me know and hopefully uh, Tom will, will jump in if I've missed anything from Discord channels. If not, then what I'll do is we'll we'll go through the, the journey that verification takes. Um, and I'll start with verify the credential because it's a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to kind of wrap our heads around. Um, and if we've got time, we'll go into how it works for a verifiable presentation. So let's take a little look at the request in more detail for the moment. Um, <clears throat> we do three checks currently, We're actually um, finishing off the, the final testing for status as well. So probably by the time you use this, um, that'll be available too. So let's go through them in the order that they're, they're visible here. Oops, I'm sorry. I clicked on the wrong button. Here we go. So first of all, it's going to look at the format. Um, as I sort of mentioned, I think I hinted at it, and it's, it's visible in one of these here. If you put in examples in the V2 or V1, you can add a type into here without needing to specify in the context. So if you note in this one here, um, alumni credential is specified as an additional verifiable credential type, but it needs to be in the context, either this way, um, where it's kind of specified in the link to it, or a context URL, JSONLD context URL with the information inside. So that's one of the first checks that we do. We do a lot of formatting. We make sure that things are correct, um, as you would expect, whether it's dates, did formats, um, missing fields, et cetera. Um, now let's take a look at proof, which is probably where the, actually look at valid, I was going to be slightly out of order and I'll leave proof to, proof to last. Here, what valid at is first of all, looking, I think this before, but I'll go into a tiny little detail, the version. It's then going to look for, this is version one, issuance date and um, expiration date. If it is version two, it looks for, so here's version two. It looks for the valid from and the valid until date, and then just checks that the date that you're checking it at is between those two dates. If it is not between those two dates, um, it'll return an error. If one of those dates is missing or one or both of those dates is missing, it will return a warning. However, you can configure the verifier to indicate that actually that warning should be an error. So that's quite useful if you're wanting to accept a document and the document needs to be in date. Um, or perhaps the document is not valid unless it's um, uh, unless it has an expiration date. Maybe the validity of the document can be a maximum of ten years. So in that sense, um, you would require an expiration date on there. And you can also then later check that expiration date is not beyond that ten year period, or the issuance and expiration date isn't over that. Now let's go into proof, which is kind of where all the interesting stuff happens. So we can just check in the questions. All good. Um, what happens is it gets it receives this um, document. I'm going to pick on actually this one here, if we don't mind. So it gets this document. It first of all essentially removes this and saves it to the side. It's mostly interesting in what's left. It then is going to convert this document into a a string which is then going to be converted into bytes and then going to be either verified or it's going to be verified um, using this proof value. So that'll be decoded to get the bytes 
and the key material that it finds from here. So we just put a pause on the key material it finds from here, because we'll come back to that in a second, and instead go to how it gets to the, the bytes that it's going to be using for verification. So because this one is using the RDFC and I don't have a JSON, uh, a JCS one that's simpler to explain, we'll do this one. Um, it goes and essentially looks up the JSON LD context and formats it in such a way that things are uh, consistent. So if I was to go and move this around here, um, it will still verify because it goes and puts it in a consistent order when it comes to doing the um, to, to generating the bytes that are needed to, for, to perform the cryptographic verification. Um, if you were to go and change a value inside of here, uh, I'll not change that because it'll format. Maybe I'll change the date to be in November instead. It will fail the validation. So there's two very different things that are happening here. Um, so once it's got that material, it then needs to hash that material and to get the public key for the, um, the, the issuer. So if you note that the issuer here is the same as the verification method, it checks that as well. What then it does is it looks at this verification method. It actually does a did URL dereferencing. You can see here that it's using um, a secondary, yeah, primary is it's using the secondary uh, did URL dereferencing to go and grab a specific part of the document. For now though, I'm gonna actually go and inspect the whole document because it make it a little bit easier to explain what's happening. Let's go over to the verifier, let's do a resolver. And let's go take a look. And we're gonna hit resolve. And inside of here, um, let's brush over a few things, but that's the the, the context again, JSON LD. So we we can identify it's it it basically defines all the fields that are inside of here. This is the resolution mess data, just give a little information about what's contained in the actual div document. And here inside the did document is what we're mostly interested in. The identifier for the did, so the same as what we looked up. Here's a verification method. You note this is an array, but it only contains one. Most contain one, but it can contain more than one, especially if you want to segregate permission. So um, the, the the type is formatted as JSON web key. You can choose to have that formatted differently, but it's, it's not particularly important. And here you can see that the cryptographic code is ED25519. If you were to format this differently um, with a different um, verification method type, you would see potentially a public key Bay 58, or you would see um, a multi key. It doesn't matter too much. It's just how it's demonstrating the uh, showing the key material. Even if there's a different verification method type, uh, ultimately it comes down to getting the key material and then performing the the verify. So here. Um, is what's kind of interesting. This is the same value as what is here. So it says you're just repeating the uh, the identifier of the did multiple times, but that's quite common. Now, why that's interesting is if you look here, we've got the authentication method and the assertion method and a few others that we'll, we'll not mention because um, we don't have any examples for that. Um, it's, let's look inside now the, the proof the purpose is assertion method. So what it's saying is we need to look up the assertion method, find if this key is listed, and then get the key material for it. So assertion method, again, this is a very simple one. It lists all the same ones. This is the same key excuse me, that is present here, so that is correct. If we go look this up inside the verification method, find the actual material, it is the first and the only one, which is great. So now it goes and grabs this key material. The hashing algorithm um, is actually defined by the the curve, and it, it's not listed here. Sometimes it will it will give you whether it's a P two five six or three eight four, but really you need to refer to the specifications. Um, and for this specification, I believe it's a two five six um, SHA two five six SHA three two five six hash. Um, but I would definitely want to check that um, before you quote me on it. Uh, regardless, it'll take the hashing algorithm hash the consistent stringified version of this 
that was done with the um, JSON LD context. And now it has the two pieces of information it needs to go and cryptographically verify. Got the public key material, it's got the um, the hash data, and it'll then perform that verification and return a true or a false, and then indicate you indicate the error to you. So I appreciate that went probably a little bit deep in, in what's going on there, but I think it's quite useful for at least you to have an idea uh, what's happening, even if you're not going to go build it yourself. Um, I can also is if. Are there any questions at the moment? If not, I can go into the verified presentation version of this. Yeah, no questions at the moment. Um, I think it's good to dive deep into how this is operating. So yeah, that's cool. Continue. Okay, let's let's do that then. So, uh, where are we? Let's go and pick on. I'm going to pick on the authentication one because this at least this presents like uh, two different things that are happening. Um, so it gives a good idea. Now, I'll do it in, well, let, let's go through the, the same order here. So first of all, it, it does the format um, checks. So it will format over the top of the presentation. Um, and then it will go and also, no, I think this, let's, let's go. So it's, it's going to, First of all, look through each of the verifiable credentials and perform all the checks against each of those credentials. So if we go and tamper with something here or change change the values essentially means tamper with it, it'll fail that check inside of the verifiable credential and, and what goes up there. But let's assume that's all correct. And this, for the moment, has followed the same scheme as before. In fact, I believe that it's exactly the same um, credentials we used here. However, the difference in this case is the crypto schema is different. Um, so this one is using the ECDSA, um, RDFC, and the 2019. There's not really too much difference between the year. Just think of it as a version number. It's the most important piece. Um, if we were to go look at this key, we'll actually see slightly different key material. Um, so here, you can see that this has got the curve, the ED25519. And I hope we see different key material. Here we do, yes. We see a P256 and it's elliptic curve. Um, what that means in this case, it's, it's indicated the hashing algorithm here. Um, if you were to, if we went back to uh, the div key, you can actually get quite a different range in the different elliptic curve uh, materials. And these have uh, different hashing algorithms. So there are some verifiers that struggle when you provide um, an elliptic curve um, with a higher hashing algorithm than 256, um, but this is supported here, so you'll be able to um, safely verify um, using any of the keys that you would have, you can get your hands on. Um, well, let me pop back into the body so we can remember where we were. No, we were, in, we were looking at authentication one. That's why we are not orientated. So it'll go perform that um, check just as it did before with the verifiable credential. So let's assume that's all good and everything is happy. Um, it then takes a look. Um, well, it's, it's already gone through the format. And again, the format's looking for the same information as before, JSON-LD, whether things are have the correct fields, types, names, et cetera. And of course, it's a proof. Um, and then it's going to look into this proof. It's going to follow a very, very similar um, pattern than it did before. Um, so let's go take a look at, at this, what's happening. Um, we're going to take a look at the verification method. Oops, I've got an extra one here. I think it's using the same, yeah, it looks like it's using the same key, so we'll get the same information. Um, and the key difference here is, is a small difference, but a really important one, because there are some did documents that give you different information. So here it's saying, I want the proof purpose that is listed inside authentication. So it's going to look inside authentication. It's going to find the proof purpose. <clears throat> and it'll, it'll say, I'm looking for the proof purpose that matches this ID, which is the one that's listed here, and then go find that verification method and be able to do the verify here. So what a quick thing to note really, really quickly and, and, and straight away is um, we could have used different assertion methods, sorry, different crypto suites, different proof um, 
could even be different types of proof entirely um, and different proof purposes. That's the intended behavior. Um, it is important that you're able to do this. The assertion method usually is created by an issuer to assert that the issuer has issued this credential, aka they sign it every round. Usually or frequently, a um, verified presentation is presented by the holder of a credential to authenticate. So that is why the authentication purpose is listed. What you may see is that there are multiple authentication methods, which allows potentially, especially in, in a um, corporate organization, the ability for more than one person to be able to authenticate. Um, and then if you use different, if you have different key material for authentication and assertion methods, this is a really good way of being able to separate the, um, like, uh, separate the concerns. So someone, so the holder of the authentication key can authenticate and the holder of the assertion key can assert. Um, and then you don't mix these things up, um, which allows you to be a little bit more fine grain and uh, have more control over what you want people to be able to do. So once it's got the authentication uh, key material, it repeats that same process. In a sense, it's, it's using the same RDFC. So it's going to use JSON-LD to straighten out that document. Let's refer to it like that. And it's going to use the um, elliptic curve and it's the 256 um, curve. And it's going to hash that to get the information. And then you'll be able to do a verification over the top of it. So in this sense, a verifier will fail if anything is altered inside the verifiable credential or inside the verifiable presentation. What you will then see as well is the addition of two extra fields for authentication. And this follows really quite closely with uh, all the other authentication methods or more uh, authentication maybe familiar with before. Domain usually is your web domain, but it could be, could be any domain. It's a, a free text field. And the challenge is a unique value, usually per request. So the idea is that um, often, so in, in our configuration, you can set the domain without having to supply in the options each time. So for testing, it could be test.example.com. And for live, it could be example.com. So you wouldn't need to provide this information because it would grab it from the configuration. And instead, the options, this is something that is um, specified each time um, because the idea is that you want to know that I've I've created this authentication request and you've provided me these credentials against that challenge at this moment in time or for this purpose and then I'll carry that on through. So you can think of it like a, uh, a random non-repeating value is the normal um, the normal use case for a challenge. I'm trying to think of it. Um, and that's that's kind of what you would have here for a verified presentation. Um, there are additional checks that you, you may want to do. So um, what is coming soon is uh, the ability to check the status. So when a verified credential, uh, there are some credentials that maybe, well, it could be all credentials, but there's some more relevant credentials where you, you may change the status of the credential after it's been created. Um, it could be revoked, it could be suspended, uh, it could be not the two examples that most commonly used and actually I, I'm struggling to think of other ones for the moment, um, but you could create any number of different statuses. Uh, what then happens is you'll see inside the credential, I don't have an example here handily, but there's um, some specs out there and we'll circulate something in, in Discord once we've got this release for you. It will show you the different possible, of uh, where to go look up the status. Um, but it doesn't define the status because the status can change. However, this variable credential is usually issued once and once a user has it in their wallet, it's in their wallet. So the status check is the ability to go look up that credential in the status endpoint to, to understand the state of the credential, whether it is suspended or revoked um, or another status. And that then allows you to make a decision on whether you accept that credential or not. And again, with that, we actually provide um, the ability to error on suspended or on revoked or to warn on suspended or revoked. And depending on your use cases, either may or may not be the right thing for you. Um, and that's kind of like, I would say the journey of um, verification for a verifiable presentation and a verifiable credential. 
um, happy to go into kind of any other details um, or we can describe other parts of the product, but I want to make sure we give a chance for anyone. If there's anything someone wants to know specifically, I think we've got about 10, 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more uh, for questions. Are there any questions specifically for for Rob or or, or anyone on the Vios team really, but about verification, resolution, validation of credentials and identities? We're more than happy to answer. If you don't want to ask here, um, our Discord is always always there um, if you have any questions, but. Um, thank you, Rob, for the the deep dive into the verification process, the looking at the various different um, formats and configurations you can have from elliptical curves to presentation layers and things like that. Um, very insightful. I mean, if, if, if there's no more questions, we can go through just some of the more generic values here as well, how the platform all, all ties together. I think it might be quite helpful for everyone. Yeah, I think that's probably mm -hmm. a good idea. Um, I, I guess oh. just to lead it off, um, there are a lot of resolution uh, and verification projects out there in the world. There's different tools that can help you do, do that. Um, one of the things that we are particularly focused on at Vidos is making it incredibly affordable to get started with and incredibly scalable. So if you develop something you know, during this hackathon on your own as part of your day-to-day, -day, whatever it is, um, we're very much designed to scale up with you. Um, and that's that's really what our, I, I guess, our sort of vision is, isn't it, Rob? Is, is, to, is to develop tools that allow people to use these things um, without fear mm -hmm. of becoming overburdened in the future. Yeah, so I think the way that we've kind of thought about it is, you know, we're building something that some of the most demanding organizations, whether it be they enterprises, mm -hmm. governments, or fast moving startups, are going to want to test out. And they, when I say test out, I mean, they're going to want to stress test. They're going to want to try new things, or they're going to need very secure access to the configuration or an audit log of how things have been created or monitoring. Um, yeah, at the same time, these are standards that exist out in the world. So we're my kind of philosophy internally is to invent as little as possible um, and to make take full advantage of the standards that exist. So and and that will then make us interoperable. Like we we follow the the specs for resolution um, and for verification. We're looking at additional specifications for requesting credentials, other types of verification as well for other standards and other types of credential formats. And we will always you know, build to a spec. So what that means is um, you will be able to very easily use us because we'll just drop in replace to, to what's there. Maybe what's there is working for you right now. But if you start accepting other credentials, could potentially become problematic. We'll be able to help with that. Yet at the same time, since we can be, or since we're essentially a drop in for, um, for anything that follows a standard, we also need to earn your trust and your your kind of uh, continued usage of us. Um, so that requires us to make sure that we're really quick, really secure. We make sure that we get everything done. Um, we've got some work to do documentation as well, um, which I'll, I'll happily own, and we'll get we'll get that improved. Um, and that's that's kind of probably what most hold you know valued and core to us. The yeah. the second thing is about how we've created these services, and we've we've gone for really granular and modular services that you can componentize. So here's the three services that we're talking about at the moment, the res resolver and the verify, which we spoke about today and the validator I'll kind of explain now. So the resolver essentially is getting the information about an identifier. Um, the verifier is taking a credential or a presentation, but essentially a verifiable credential in its most broad term and answering the question of, is this credential valid from in the terms of the issuer? <clears throat> and then the validator says, is this credential valid or okay in the terms of the person that is 
going to be using it. So it's using the reliant yeah, party. Yeah, the use case, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So to give a kind of example here is um, your passport, if your passport expires next week, it's valid. It will pass the verified test. So it will go to the issuer and they'll say, uh, and they'll say, well, yeah, everything's, everything all checks out. However, for maybe a visa processing um, center, you might need a passport that's valid for six months to get a visa. So the passport is valid, but it doesn't hit the use case that's needed. And that's the distinction between the VIDOS validator and the VIDOS verifier. So it allows you to be able to kind of use the right tool for the right job. And our yeah. configurations are built in this really modular way that you can just kind of like drop them on top of each other. Um, so that if we take the uh, the domain example inside of authentication, you can have a production configuration and a, a development configuration with a different value there. Mm -hmm. And then you could have different application configurations for um, I don't know, application one, application two, and you can just combine them together. So for application one development, you 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 take these two configurations, apply them to the verifier, and the settings get applied. And they're the sort of things that like, you know, enterprises that where, where maybe a compliance team is owning one configuration, but the application or the ops team is owning another configuration, yet they still need to work together. So it allows that separation. So you can specify who can who can modify and who can apply those. Sorry, Tom, what you say? No, I think yeah, you hit hit the nail on the head. I was just going to say it's um, it your use case example of the passport is 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 very good because a passport is, you know, verified and and verified to have come from an authentic, uh, source, is one thing. But is it valid for applying for a six month visa versus you know, just going over the border for? 24 hours those are very different use cases so separating out separating out the is this legitimate in the verifier versus the is it legitimate for this use case in the validator yeah it, it makes a lot of sense to to separate those those questions out yeah 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 absolutely and another thing is actually we didn't touch on here but since we're talking about the validator and verifier um the issuer uh, the issuer of a passport. Um, so let, let, let's just kind of take a fake example that the passport would look like a verifiable credential and just have addition JSON LD and a few different documents. Um, that issuer, for, for those of you that are kind of like thinking this through in your head, um, is could be any DID. And since we have a, a, a resolver that supports many DIDs, you could go just create your own DID and then issue passports. Um, obviously, that's not how things exist in the current world, and that's not how things are designed to exist in, in the next world. Um, so the validator will have what is described as a trusted list. So while the issuer may say, yes, this passport is valid, um, the, 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 the verifier will say the passport is valid from the terms of the issuer. The validator will say, well, we don't accept the issuer of fake country um, to be issuing passports that we're going to issue visas to a real country. Um, so they're the sort of distinctions that you might make and the ways that allow you to separate things out. So that distinction, again, means that you can make very, very business conscious decisions about what you accept depending on the use case that you're trying to achieve. Whereas to use the exact same analogy, but rather than a passport issuer, maybe it's for a conference and issuing badges to a conference, you can become your own issuer and you can issue conference badges to all your attendees and the verifier will go yes these are legitimate badges you know they've not been they're not fake tickets or whatever and we recognize the authority of the issuer um so exactly. that's a you know same situation but with a different type of issuer yeah less authority i guess than a, a passport manufacturer but yeah <laughs> i think or it's just the correct authority i don't i don't suppose yeah. the passport office will let you issue um i wouldn't accept a concert ticket from the passport no, office so. no even if it is for oasis yeah <laughs> yeah um and then i guess the other last part to add which i'm probably stealing words from rob's mouth now is that um all of these services are available by a simple api call um or you can access it through our our, our web interface on the dashboard um, to configure certain policies, set up cores, create new instances if you need to do that instance separation across teams, 
Um, but yeah, they are all available in many different formats, depending on how it is you want to use them. Um, I think I said it at the beginning, but I'll say it now. Um, if you are attempting to resolve something or verify something and it's not working as expected, please use the Duration of this Hackathon and actually in the future as well as an opportunity to reach out to us. Just uh, for now, just drop it in the Discord, say, hey, try to resolve this or verify this. It didn't work. Um, someone in my team will take some time to have a little look at why that is happening um, and we'll get back to you. Um, hopefully that can be a helpful resource for you when you're trying to figure out how things are working. Absolutely. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning uh, as of, I think, literally last week, we got the TBD DHT uh, did method um, working with our resolver and verifier as well. So um, yeah, welcome welcome to the Vidos family, TBD and, and DHT. It's good to have you here. Um, if there's another did method or yeah type of verified credential that you you want added and and you want to make use of, let us know and we will we'll work with you to get it up, get it listed. Yeah, definitely. I, our customers are pretty demanding, so um, we we <laughs> yeah. will not be shocked. We'll be delighted if you come with something um, yeah. that you're after, and we'll, we'll try and work it out. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's it. So thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to learn a bit about the Vidos system. Um, we can't wait. I know I've said it so many times, but we can't wait to see what you're building. Um, <laughs> it, it's very good to be part of a, an active hackathon and people that are you know, passionate about this stuff. So yeah, very exciting. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you so much, Tom. And we'll make the recording available both in the Discord and also it will go up on YouTube before, well before the hackathon is over. Um, it's going to take a few days, but um, but it will be up there very soon so we can get that out. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and if you want to continue the discussion in Discord after this, if you have any questions uh, that just came to mind that you didn't think of during the call, um, the, the link is there in the chat as well. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.